Well, congregation, as I mentioned in our congregational prayer, we are on to part 11 of our series on the nature and character of God. And today we are talking about God's gentleness, goodness, and kindness. Now, there, there are a couple of problems that we'll explore a little bit when we get into, uh, when we get into the sermon more, uh, having to do with what do those words mean? mean? Um, because sometimes they can be pretty vague in our language. And so we'll look at those a little bit more. But before we get too far into that, we want to, as always, thank uh, Karen Sare, the creator of the Infographics Bible, for her work and for allowing us to replicate this particular graphic that we've been using over the past number of weeks. So thank you to her and to Zonder Vaughn, her publisher, for allowing us to do that. And as we look at um, God's character and nature in this overall graphic, I want to take a moment to remind us or tell us something that's really important that I haven't had a chance to uh, really illuminate over the last little while. And that is there is a weakness with this graphic, with all of them, probably, all graphics, that is. And, and that is that uh, the nice, neat, tidy little boxes in which everything is placed almost makes it look like God's characteristics are all neatly and tidily categorized and separate from one another, that they don't overlap with each other. But that, of course, is simply ridiculous. That's just not true. You cannot separate God's goodness and gentleness and kindness from one another in some ways any more than you can separate from me that I am a dad and a, a husband and a pastor and so on. Those things are, are, are all intertwined to together. My characteristics, my nature, they overlap and interweave and so on, and so does God's. So when we talk about God's gentleness and goodness and kindness, we are not talking necessarily about th three things that are totally separate from one another and never meet together. Rather, we are talking about um, we are talking about words we use to describe parts, portions of God's character. So just remember that they're overall, they're, they're together. Now, as we dive into the scriptures and we look at the passage from Matthew chapter 11 about God's goodness, note that we zoom in again and we see that, that God's gentleness and goodness and kindness are listed under his moral character. In other words, these are things about him that are, that are morally good, uh, to be a little bit redundant using the word good in a, a definition. But these are things about God that fit under those moral categories. So let us look first of all at Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, where Jesus says to, uh, to his disciples and to his listeners and to all of us and to everyone in this world, he says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Once again, we see that this quote is, is taken from Jesus, but since Jesus is the very, um, the very word of God, and Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit are one, any characteristics that Jesus has, the, the, the Father and the Spirit will also have. And so we see Jesus saying that he is gentle. 
We have to ask ourselves, of course, what that means, but we'll get to that in a few moments. Let's move on now instead to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, verses uh, 18 in 19. And in this passage, again, we hear from Jesus. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. Now Jesus makes that statement and then he goes on to teach the ruler uh, what is required to inherit eternal life. But the point for our purposes this morning is that Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one but God is good. And this is interesting because Jesus is putting the ruler on the spot and also his listeners saying, am I God? Am I the son of God? Because if they are honest with him and if they if they are honest with themselves and if they are honest with him, looking back on who Jesus is, who, who they know Jesus to be, they can see that he is, unlike other people, truly good. And so Jesus is forcing them to look and examine themselves and examine Jesus and be honest with themselves about who Jesus is is. But let's move on to kindness, God's kindness. We can find that in Titus chapter 3 verses 3 to 5a, where the author of Titus says, at one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of, our go- our, of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared. So God is gentle and good and kind. But I don't know about you, for me those words seem somewhat vague. What does it mean to be kind to someone? What does it mean to be gentle? I I mean, I can think of some examples, but I I struggle a little bit with what those things mean. And good, oh, good is something that's applied in so many places, right? That tastes good. Oh, good man. Oh, good day. Goodbye. You know, what are we talking about when we talk about goodness? Well, let's look at what the Bible says about goodness and gentleness and kindness. These are, uh, these are some definitions that various books and scholars ha- have uh, brought up out of the scriptures. Gentleness, first of all. Gentleness, uh, in, in our particular context, comes from uh, the word tov in Hebrew, tov. And... Um, it also, uh, or sorry, ana, sorry, my mistake, I was skipping ahead. Ana, right? Uh, that's the word in Hebrew, ana. And then in uh, Greek, it is epikeia, right? Um, gentleness. And I love what the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia says. It says it is to bend low, to bend low low, to condescend, gentleness. I mean, think about that. It is so true. 
You can see it in the father who bends low to talk to his child, to get down on their level, so that he is not shouting, he is not coming from a power position, he is coming down to speak face to face, gently and calmly with a child, with someone small, someone who may be vulnerable. And when we place that idea in in the framework of who God is, we can see that God very much has been gentle with us. What, What more bending low can you imagine than the God who creates and sustains the universe coming and becoming one of us? bending low to talk with us. The second word, good, um, is, uh, like I mentioned mistakenly for uh, the first, is tov, the Hebrew word tov, which is good, useful, pleasing, having the qualities that make something useful or desirable. Right? That's why we describe food as being good. It is, uh, if it's good food, then it is both desirable because it is yummy, <laughs> it is delicious, but it is also good because it is useful. It helps to give us the energy, the stamina we need to get through our day to do the things that we need to do. It is good because it is useful, and desirable. And when we, when we think about that in terms of God, not that we think of God as an object to be desired or uh, an object to be used, but rather certainly the adjectives useful uh, and, and desirable are understatements for who God is. God is someone who is a being who is more useful than anything else could possibly ever be. And God is more desirable than anything else could ever be as well. The psalmist says, Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. The psalmist longs for the words of God, hangs on the law of God, desires righteousness. The psalmist knows and says to us over and over again how desirable God is. And that is partly because the psalmist knows how how useful and good God is. Not that we can use or manipulate God, but rather that we we have nothing if we do not have God. And kindness, kindness, this is from one of my favorite Christian musicians, Steve Bell, who is a a very wise and uh, wonderful man and who sings beautifully. If you don't know Steve Bell, he's a Canadian artist. Check him out. This is what Steve Bell says about kindness. Kindness flows from a knowledge of the kinship of all things. What the saints have ever known that a lived conviction conviction of positive regard for the other, cherishing even enemies, is the sanest way forward. Now, that maybe needs a little bit of unpacking. But essentially, Steve Bell is connecting the, eye of, the idea of kinship or family relationship with kindness. Kinship. It is a positive regard for the other. And this is so hard. 
we have a tendency in our fallenness to look at the other, the other person, the other thing with suspicion and fear. The things that we do not know, we are uncomfortable with, we do not like. We see this all the time. Everything from the racism that we are talking about so much in our world today, where where people who have one skin color are, are suspicious and fearful and treat badly people with a different skin color. Because they are the other. They are people who we don't know. They are the people we see as foreigners. And so, therefore, they are somehow dangerous. And we are suspicious of them. But we also see it in politics. We see people who are on the right or the left who are fearful of each other. You have different views about how society should work than I do. Therefore, you must be strange. You are the other. You are to be feared. And maybe to be hated or looked down upon or despised. Not only, of course, do we see this in domestic politics, but we see it all over the world where people of different politics, different religions, different backgrounds, different skin colors, different genders, different orientations, whatever, you put fill in the blank with anyone who is other than you. And I can do the same. And our tendency is to fear and to hate, to be suspicious and to despise. But brothers and sisters, that is not what kindness is. Our God is kind, for he knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that everything has kinship with him. Everything came from him. Everything was created by him. Everything is sustained by him. And so he looks with positive regard upon all of us. Even those who declare themselves enemies of God. So brothers and sisters, this is our God. Our God who is gentle. Our God who bends low to be with us. Our God who is good. Who is the ultimate desirable and usefulness in the world. And our God who is kind. Now the question comes up, of course, what do we do? Do with that? What does it mean for us? Well, of course, once again, uh, uh, and I, I know it sounds like a broken record, but it's true, we stand in awe. We stand in awe of a God who bent low to be with us, to speak on our love level. We stand in awe of a God who is so utterly, totally desirable and essential for anything to exist. It goes beyond usefulness into the essential, and we stand in awe. And we look at a God who is kind, who regards us positively even while we were still his enemies. The Bible says very clearly that God sent his son even while we were still his enemies to die for us. But then what does it mean for ourselves? 
Well, we have to ask ourselves, in terms of our behavior, that is, we have to ask ourselves, do we see the kinship in everyone and everything? Do we look at the people around us or the people far away from us? Do we look at them and say, that is my kin? That person is family to me. That person, no matter how near or far, is my brother or sister. Do we see everyone and every created thing as kin to us? And if not, why not? The Bible is very clear that we were all created by God. We all share the same Heavenly Father. Why do we not see our fellow human beings as our kin? Why do we not see the creatures that God has created as our kin? Certainly with different roles, certainly with different abilities, but nonetheless, they are our kin. We all exist because of his sustaining power, whether it's the smallest microbe or whether it's the most powerful person we are all here because of God. We need to cherish one another, even our enemies. Secondly, we need, to, we need to recognize, we need to see the goodness of God. We need to, like the psalmist, desire God because he is eminently desirable. He is to be desired above all things. This past week, Mike Pence, the vice president of the United States, made a speech at the Republican National Convention, and I am not, I don't, really care about whether you're Republican or Democrat. I mean, you're Canadian, so you're probably not either of those. Doesn't matter to me. But he quoted from the scriptures, or rather misquoted from the scriptures, and told us instead of fixing our eyes on Jesus, we ought to fix our eyes on old glory and this nation of heroes. And I don't know whether he intended to be blasphemous or not, but he was, whether he intended it or not. Because God is the only one whom we should fix our eyes upon. That passage in Hebrews chapter 12 says very clearly that we ought to fix our eyes on Jesus and definitely not on a nation or a flag or a battle, or anything like that. Do we see, brothers and sisters, the desirability of God? Do we see how useful he is, essential even, that nothing else compared to God matters? And lastly, lastly, since God is gentle with us, with, since God has bent low for us, do we bend low for others? Are we gentle in this way? Will we willingly bow our knees, remove our outer garments, and wash the feet of others, even the feet of the Judas in our lives. Brothers and sisters, God is gentle and good and kind. And we receive that with joy and gratitude and awe. Let us also give gentleness and goodness and kindness 
in his name and through his power to all those around us. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so very much for this day. Thank you so very much for teaching us from scriptures. Thank you so very much that you have been and are and will be gentle and good and kind. We humbly and in awe receive this from you. And Lord, we also, we recognize your call for us to be like you in this. That we too are called to be in your name and through your power gentle and good and kind. Lord, strengthen us in this, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.